Welcome back. This is the second lecture on realism, realism outside France. We'll return to France at the very end of this lecture to take a look at the realist painter Manet, M-A-N-E-T. But I wanted to show primarily some realist painters in this country because it really is um, the first style in America that was well responded to by the American public. The American public was not overly fond of neoclassical style. Uh, the romantic landscape painting fared fairly well, but American realism really uh, made sense. It is part of the culture to this day. There have been several studies that have been done about what American audiences prefer in uh, artwork that they like to view, and overwhelmingly, things that look like what they're supposed to be tends to be um, at the heart of what we as Americans tend to like in the artwork that we're looking at. So some names you may have heard of, Winslow Homer you'll see today. Uh, we'll take a look at Thomas Eakins. Uh, John Singer Sargent for sure is a name that you've heard you may not be familiar with Henry Sawa Tanner, but a remarkable painter, uh, African-American painter, and probably the true first uh, African-American internationally recognized superstar in painting um, that this country has produced, and um, a war hero to boot. Uh, and of course, we'll look at Manet, M-A-N-E-T, and we'll look at the very, very influential exhibition known as the Salon de Refuse. So Winston Homer was primarily working essentially as a kind of journalist. He uh, created illustrations for various publications, uh, most notably Harper's Weekly. And specifically for Harper's Weekly, he was recording things that the technology of the camera, even using the uh, glass plate or wet plate technology was not able to capture things in real motion and so artists quite frequently were called upon to do sketches and drawings on site to kind of show people what was actually happening on the battlefields of the civil war so the image at the top left is actually of a shooter or sniper uh, it is the finished version of an oil painting that he made from his original sketch but i just wanted you to get a sense of what the artist's role was during the Civil War. You can see how painting things the way they're really supposed to look, uh, making things look like the real world, would be absolutely essential to telling this story. Uh, at the bottom, you see Homer's uh, painting prisoners from the front. This is a Union officer who is receiving the surrender. Um, and still showing the dignity of the Confederate troops who are surrendering to him. So Homer is definitely involved in recording all kinds of aspects of the Civil War, including paintings that we don't have time to look at now, but paintings of African-American soldiers, um, paintings of former slaves after the Civil War, after emancipation. It's kind of remarkable, uh, the subject matter that he took on. But in terms of being... Um, published, the work that he did as sketches during the war were then given over to engravers. They would take uh, sections of hard, very hard wood, usually boxwood, uh, cut into small squares. They would be carving not along the grain, but against the grain on the end of the grain end of the wood, allowing for very, very, very fine lines to be incised. So these are still relief prints. Where you cut it is where the image is white and ink sticks to the uncut, raised surface. But you can see how the image is just here a little bit to go from his original sketch uh, to this wood engraving that was then published in Harper's Weekly. Take a look here as we get really close in. You can see how all those values are achieved. It's essentially like hatching or cross-hatching. The more lines that there are closer together, the darker the area looks, the fewer lines with more white space between them, the lighter that image appears to be. This is the Homer piece to know for the test. I wanted to pick a particularly happy one. This is post-Civil War. Uh, pretty iconic image, Snap the Whip. I'm pretty sure that this was on the cover of the first copy of Tom Sawyer that I had as a kid. And it is an oddly nostalgic 
image. Even if you didn't go to a one-room schoolhouse and play barefoot in a field, it somehow feels very American, uh, kind of innocent, and many of us, I think, can identify with playing on a playground as children, but I think it's kind of essential to notice that there's no adults here, that this is a world where joy is still possible, where people can kind of come together, work together. Obviously, they're all male. Obviously, they're all white, but we know that Homer's work includes people of all different types, so I don't think that this piece is specifically um, aimed at a political message, but I do think it's aimed at restoring a sense of joy after a big national uh, conflict. Thomas Eakins is perhaps the most significant of the American realist painters who was also an art instructor. In fact, he taught at America's first established art academy, the Pennsylvania Academy. Now, he was a teacher of drawing and painting, and so he encouraged, of course, study from nude models. And this piece kind of gives you the idea of why that would be so important in terms of the accuracy of representing the body, getting the proportions correct. But what's pretty remarkable about the painting, we've talked before about um, the fact that prior to our time period, uh, men especially would swim in the nude, so this is not a sexual aspect of the image. But you notice the figure that's diving off the stone, that's a pretty hard, uh, pose to hold if you're trying to pose a model who's not going to move that you can draw from um, in a studio scenario, you can see a lot of these poses would be difficult to maintain for any length of time. These two, lounging, standing perhaps, this reaching a little difficult, possibly slipping here, swimming itself, pretty hard to hold the pose in that exact moment. So how did he achieve this level of realism? Well, Eakins was friends with a photographer, Morley Bridge, and Eakins also took photographs himself. So here are photographs of many of the art students enjoying uh, going out for a swim, but also being used in a way as models for the painting. And the photography is now allowing for a little bit faster um, shutter speed. So you can see these two figures are really in motion, and that's what Eakins is really trying to capture in this work. What made him a superstar, though, beyond his accuracy with anatomy, was this painting in particular. This is called the Gross Clinic. It's called that because the name of the doctor, who's the main figure here in the center, he is Dr. Gross. So even though the painting's a little gross, uh, the name of the painting is based on the the fact that it is essentially a portrait. So in a very American way, it is a portrait of someone doing the thing that made them famous. Dr. Gross was a surgeon, but he was also a teaching surgeon in a medical college. Jefferson Medical College still owns this piece to this day. So Eakins is showcasing a master at the top of his profession who is demonstrating a technique for medical students who will have to perform surgeries like this themselves. He's actually operating and delivering a lecture about the operation simultaneously. He's operating on a young man's femur, that's your thigh bone, the longest bone in the body, and it's a little hard for us to see the patient because he's actually foreshortened. His feet are coming toward us. There's his feet in little bluish socks and his head is back here. This is his hip, tush, that's the thigh. So they're opening the incision here to work on the femur. You can see that the doctor has complete control and confidence, his team is completely focused. The figure in the background here is his secretary who's taking notes so they can publish a paper about this later. You notice kind of the intense observation of the students. They're leaning over even to get a view of what's going on. The doctor's son is in the background, kind of admiringly watch his father proceed to do this uh, operation. The only figure who's reacting in a really emotional way is right here. And that figure that's hiding her face and clawing at the air is the mother of the patient. The whole operation is taking place in this kind of calm because of the introduction of anesthesia, which of course we didn't have on the battlefields of the Civil War, and it really changes medical science going forward. It's a pretty remarkable uh, piece. 
but it also harkens back to a culture that I said earlier was very similar to our own. We think of America as being primarily a Protestant uh, country that thrives on this uh, taste for realism. We like things to look like what they're meant to be. We like pictures of people the way they really are. Think about how much we disliked the neoclassical statue of Hooray Greenhouse, uh, statue of George Washington. We like things that are closer to reality. And that was also true of a Protestant culture we've already studied, the Dutch Baroque. This is Rembrandt's Dr. Tulp, who's doing a dissection for his students. So clearly a very close connection between the culture we've already talked about and our own. This is not the only medical image that Tommy Kins did. There's also the Agnew, uh, which includes the um, presence of a female chief nurse. So women were definitely becoming active in the medical field and being recognized as professionals in that setting as well. John Singer Sargent is an expatriate. Again, that means that he's living abroad, uh, although still an American citizen, does not mean he hated America. He is working in primarily in Florence. Uh, he does exhibit work in uh, the Paris Salon as well. And this particular painting is one that caused a huge scandal in the Salon of 1884. This was a painting of a woman who was from an American family. In fact, her family was from Louisiana. They owned a rather swanky uh, building on a plantation. That is her family home at Parlange Plantation, just outside of New Orleans. It is um, definite that her family came from money, for sure. But that money allowed her to live a pretty glamorous lifestyle overseas. Uh, she ends up married to a man who works in the financial industry. And here she is in the height of French fashion, which would have been considered completely scandalous in America. It was pretty scandalous and racy for its time, even in France. Look at the plunging neckline. We haven't seen a neckline that low, I don't think, all semester. We've seen women either completely nude or with a fairly low neckline, but not quite like this. That almost looks like a design that you could see on a red carpet in an American awards show today. Notice in the original sketch that you can't really see the strap on this. Originally, the strap was actually hanging off her shoulder as if the dress was about to fall off. And he finally was forced to kind of repaint it to give her a little bit more modesty. But you can see that it looks extraordinarily realistic. But when you get really close to the surface of that painting, you realize it's painted in very loose brushwork. So Sargent was really a master of this combination of fluid mark making with the paintbrush and absolute precision in terms of proportion and portraiture. Pretty amazing piece. The Sargent to know for the test shows you that fluid brushwork a little more obviously. If you look at the girl's skirts, if you look at the patterns that are painted onto the vases, you can see how loose the brushwork really is. This is a commission that Sargent received from uh, some family friends who were also Americans living abroad, wealthy Americans, in fact. They were living primarily off of the wife's money, uh, and her family had a business trading um, in goods from overseas, particularly China, uh, vases would be a pretty um, prominent aspect of what the family collected and sold. So here we have some gorgeous vases that are taller than their children. What we're seeing is the entrance hall to the um, apartments that they lived in in Paris. A uh, very fashionable district, fashionable among Americans living abroad. And the four girls are the daughters of the couple. Um, it is meant to be a portrait of them, but in the most unusual way, and having them posed together on a couch, everyone looking forward. The only uh, image that really feels as if we're being directly confronted is the little girl off to the left. The others, some of them are not looking directly at us, looking to the side, looking near us. Um, you get a feeling that this is a staged setting that is far, far different from the type of pose you might expect in a typical portrait. It also receives 
recedes further and further back into the darkness. Each daughter, as you move from front to back, is less and less linked, kind of hidden in the shadow of that entryway. It's hard to look at this and not think about the work of Diego Velasquez. This is Velasquez Las Meninas we studied a little while ago, and it's a very similar painting in terms of its structure. It is also one in which the main uh, feature is not the most interesting thing. The main subject or the main person in the image is not quite as interesting as the structure of the painting itself. It feels as if both images have a bit of mystery behind them. We know that Sargent specifically drew and printed copies of Velázquez's work when he traveled in 1879 to Madrid. So we know that there's a very direct connection between this Baroque idea of Velázquez and the painting that he's doing now for his commission. That brings us to Henry Osawa Tanner, who is the son of a minister whose mother was also a former slave. So this is an African-American painter connected to the highest levels of the burgeoning African-American uh, elite class in terms of the level of power and influence that his father had as a minister, but also tied to the horrors of the era of slavery in this country. He definitely moved among uh, a wealthier uh, section of the African-American community. He was not directly exposed to extreme poverty. He was born in Philadelphia. He spent most of his life there before going to study overseas and settling in Paris. He had at one time studied with Thomas Eakins. He then makes his permanent home in Paris. He comes back to America briefly uh, for health reasons and to um, replenish his uh, financial situation, his uh, bank account was getting a little bit low and he was uh, also ill. So his doctor suggested that he spend some time uh, back home in America, specifically in the mountains. He came to North Carolina, believe it or not. And there he took photographs that you see at the bottom on the left and did sketches of grandfather and son the grandfather teaching the son to play the banjo. It was really the first time that he was directly to face with the um, generational divide between the generation that had seen slavery and the first generation to be born outside of that system. Notice that the grandfather is in a deeper shadow, cooler colors, and the light is falling on the future, on the youth, on the grandson. It's a really powerful piece in that way. Tanner's also known for his religious paintings, primarily, but also for his work um, in the Second World War, or the First World War, rather, in particular. He was a member of the Red Cross. He was awarded the Legion of Honor from the French um, after the war in uh, 1923. He is someone who lectured, traveled, became an international star as an artist. He said pretty directly that when he was at home, when he was in America, he was known as the, as the term would have been used then, the Negro painter Tanner. But when he was in Europe, he was known as the talented painter Tanner. This is kind of an interesting thing to think about the view that he would have had of race relations, of racism, of how people view one another based on color coming from America, but then living abroad and seeing a difference, how he's treated and received by the art community. Uh, what is the term that is most frequently used about him outside of this country? Talent, that he's remarkable. What is the term used when he's back home? Skin color. It's kind of an interesting um, way of viewing how things have changed over time. This is Tanner's version of the Annunciation. It's my personal favorite of his paintings because it's a subject we already know. There's a woman seated looking at something more powerful in a bit of surprise. That angelic forms on the left, seated figure on the right. We've seen that in multiple Annunciations, but we've never seen one that didn't have the angel look like a person 
with wings. Here the angel is manifested as a being of pure light, something so powerful we can barely perceive it in reality. It is a really remarkable painting. I like to think of it almost as a special effect in a film. It has that kind of level of drama and intensity. Tanner's The Thankful Poor is perhaps his best known piece in this country, and it clearly builds on the same themes that saw with the banjo player. The old and young notice again that the grandfather's in, sh in shadow and the grandson is in full light. That brings us to the last artist for this section, Edouard Manet, M-A-N-E-T. We are headed now back to France, and this is the work of a realist French painter who's going to inspire the Impressionist movement. So Manet with an A is the leader of that uh, movement in terms of being the inspiration. Monet with an O is the painter who is going to uh, change the style. So Manet with an A is uh, a painter who definitely knows his art history. He knows the types of images that have been acceptable in the salon traditionally. He knows um, the types of imagery that we have accepted in terms of nudity of the female form, as long as it is associated with the classics, with Greece, Rome, with mythology, we're fine. This is a painting that is obviously not Venus. This woman is wearing mules, high-heeled slippers. She's still wearing her jewelry. She's receiving from her servant a bouquet of flowers. There's an implication that someone is there who's given the flowers to the maid to deliver to her to welcome uh, someone into this room. We're looking really quite accurately, I think, what it would be like to be a high-class courtesan a prostitute of sorts. So this would have absolutely shocked French audiences. It seems like something we've saw in the neoclassical era. It seems a little bit like the uh, odalisque that we saw by Anne um, in the harem. But this is not someone in a harem. This is someone in a Parisian apartment. This is not someone from an other culture. It's not someone from another mythological tradition. It's someone in the here and now, and she's directly confronting us. Notice that she looks straight out of the image at us, almost daring us to respond to her in a negative way. We know that Mana used the same model, and that model was a painter herself, so she's not really the person who posed for it, is not really a courtesan or, or prostitute, but that's the feeling that we're supposed to get. Notice how similar this painting is to this painting that we studied before by Titian. Titian's Venus of Urbino was completely acceptable because she was meant to be perceived as the goddess Venus. It's almost the exact same painting, down to there being a pet on the foot of the bed and a servant in the background. It's even divided with a curtain in almost the exact same place vertically here and here. When you really think about what Manet is doing, he knows his art history. He knows what he's saying. He's showing you that Titian showed the beauty of the female nude in a contemporary setting and got away with it by making it seem as if she was a mythological goddess. He is daring to say, why can't we look at the beauty of the female form now in reality, in this new realist style? So you can imagine how shocking this piece was to European audiences. People did not want to see this in the salon. This even more so. This was the piece really that sparked what we call the Salon des Refusés. So the Academy has control of what types of art training are available. Membership in the Academy is dependent upon pleasing the existing Academy members by exhibiting work that they find acceptable in the annual Salon. This piece was submitted to the Salon of 1863 and rejected. Thousands of pieces were not accepted that year. This is the most notorious of those pieces. It is scandalous for a host of reasons, one of which, of course, is the nudity, but even more so, a nude woman, woman with two 
clothed male companions and a very nearly nude female companion in the background is a scandal waiting to happen. Notice again, it's the same model that we saw in the previous painting, Olympia, and just like that painting, she is looking directly out of the canvas at us, as if daring us to find anything to say to her in a negative way. She knows she's nude, and she doesn't seem phased by it at all. So there's kind of a remarkable level of confidence on her face. The fact that the men are posed there so casually, their feet kind of intertwined, they are fully dressed, but they don't seem to be making sexual advances toward her. They seem to be engaged in conversation as a group, as if the fact of her being nude is not something um, that is the sole focus of why they are there, as if they have so much going on in their lives together to discuss that there's not a need to focus solely on um, lusting after her or looking at her in a lewd way. There's a picnic lunch nearby. You see that in the left foreground. So the painting is known as Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, which translates as the luncheon on the grass. To help you remember the difference between Manet and Monet, who you'll meet in the next lecture, it may help you to remember this picnic and think about putting mayonnaise on a sandwich. And you may remember the picnic and think mayonnaise with an A and seven O. It's silly, but it does help you remember. The painting is scandalous for a bunch of reasons, not the least of which is the nudity and the clothed men. Notice the weird spatial effect. If you look at the boat behind this figure's head, it looks like it's in the far distance. It's really small because, of course, it's further away. But if we follow the shoreline, Suddenly, this figure seems out of proportion, as if she's really enormous. So there are intentional errors in perspective. There's an intentional flatness and lack of curvaceous modeling of the shadows on the body, which people objected to. There were plenty of reasons for this painting to be rejected. What was definitely at the back of the mind of the people who were viewing it was that this painting didn't fit into categories, that it was not a historical painting, it wasn't a mythological scene, it didn't have a precedent. But that's completely false. Manet, in fact, is making a comment about paintings like this. We did this previously. Remember, we saw the work of Giorgione and the work of Titian. This is the uh, pastoral concert. And in this painting, we have two men fully clothed and two women in states of undress in a public outdoor space. We see the men are engaged in a conversation and they're not lusting after the women. We've seen this image before. Why was this one acceptable to people? Well, because these women, even though they're nude and we'll see their bodies, these two women are meant to represent muses who are inspiring the two men. So he's playing on that idea for sure, but he's going one step further. Take a look at this uh, engraving based on an image by Raphael. And as I put that red rectangle there, you see those three figures? That is the exact same pose that we just saw in Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe. So he is literally repainting a Raphael painting of nude mythological gods and putting them in a historical context of a contemporary space. He is absolutely having a great time, I think, making fun of the fact that we're squeamish about nudity, that we're squeamish about including images in the salon that have anything to do with contemporary culture, that we would just as well be happy making the same paintings of the same subjects over and over and over again. So the salon itself in 1863 went ahead as scheduled, but there were so many works rejected, there was so much talk about it, that the leader of France at the time, the heir of Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon III, decided that they had to set up what they called the Salon des Refusés, exhibition of all of the rejected works. So it was the first chance that the public had to look at art that had been censored, art that had been rejected, that wasn't good in the opinion of the Academy. And of course, a lot of people went to the show and agreed with the Academy that these things were terrible and should never been shown. 
other people went and thought art can do something different. Art doesn't have to be exactly the way it's always been. Think about the fact that we had 200 years worth of reviving the classical world of Greece and Rome during the Renaissance, followed by 100 years of continuing the Renaissance with just a little more drama and shadow and action in the Baroque. That's 300 years, followed by a brief period of the Rococo, and then followed immediately by the neoclassical to go back to the Renaissance ideals again. We've had it drilled into our heads that art in Europe, art in the West, is based on Greece and Rome. It's all about nude, perfectly proportioned gods and goddesses and historical events, and it has nothing to do with average people's everyday lives. And so that's what realism is all about, is about breaking that rule apart and showing it for what it is. Manet is doing that in the most brilliantly subversive way that I think any artist up to his time had been able to do. So the younger artists seeing what he's doing with this piece are going to jump on that. They're going to then want to create artwork that shows the real world the way it really is. That brings us to the last piece I want you to see here by Manet, the bar at the Folie Bergère. This is uh, a painting that is a location that he went quite frequently in the real world. When he was working on the painting, though, he actually set up a bar in his studio and asked one of the barmaids to pose for him and to come to the studio in her uh, uniform, so to speak, and pose for him there. You can see that in the mirror behind her is reflected the entire cabaret nightclub um, that the Folie Berger really represented. You see in the mirror also, although it's kind of an impossible perspective, she is serving a client. So I guess we are the man in the top hat coming up to her to get a drink. You can see how loose the brushwork is if you look at the still life item, the forefront of the painting. If you look at the light falling on her dress, you also see loose brushwork. Here's really the beginnings of the Impressionist style. You can see it in Manet's work for sure. It's going to be even more evident when we look at the work of Monet. If you take a look at the foreground in the right-hand side, you can even see, although it's uh, done with loose dibs and dabs of paint, the logo of Bass Ale, which is pretty much unchanged to this. It's the first official registered trademark to come out of UK, and at the time, it was the biggest brewery in Europe, if not the entire world. So this is a painting of the real world, slightly fantasy-oriented, fan uh, fantasy slightly romanticized, I suppose, but ultimately, art is beginning to do something completely different thanks to Manet. The next stuff that you'll see will take the real world and filter it through the expression of the effects of light and color. You'll see the work of Monet and the other Impressionists next.